Hi everyone, this is Dr. Nitin Choda with a very important episode of Ignition Time. I believe that every single United States taxpayer should watch this video. In this video, I'm going to answer the important question. Is a second stimulus check and extended unemployment benefits possible without taxpayer dollars, without taxpayer funds, what you must know. I'm going to go over three things in this video. The first is the size of the United States economy. I'm going to measure it in GDP compared to several other countries in the world and I think it will surprise you. Number two, I'm going to talk to you about how the federal government gets its money and how it spends its money. And number three, I'm going to answer the question, is it possible to have economic stimulus? Is it possible to have continued unemployment benefits without taxpayer dollars. So to start with, I'll talk about the size of the United States economy and how it compares with the rest of the world. I've been reading a lot of comments and feedback about how countries like Canada, how countries like Germany are doing much better with the economic stimulus than the United States. From a GDP standpoint, from a gross domestic product standpoint, those countries have a much smaller GDP compared to the United States. In fact, let's take a look at some of these numbers. Let's go from the bottom all the way to the top. And I've only picked a few countries when showing you the GDP comparison. Let's start with Australia. The GDP of Australia is 1.4 trillion US dollars. The GDP of Russia is 1.65 trillion dollars. These are most recent statistics. The GDP of Canada is 1.71 trillion dollars. The GDP of India is 2.71 trillion dollars. The GDP of the United Kingdom is 2.85 trillion dollars. All of this is in US dollars. The GDP of Germany is almost 4 trillion US dollars. The GDP of China is 13.61 trillion dollars and the GDP of the United States of America is 20.54 trillion US dollars. So you can see that the United States at this moment in time is the biggest country in the world in terms of GDP significantly ahead of all other countries at this moment in time. In other words, we tend to spend the most, we tend to have the most transactions, we tend to have the biggest transactions. In other words, we spend way more money than the rest of the world. I was actually curious about how these numbers changed over the years, over the past 30 years. So I did some analysis of how the GDP of different countries changed from from the 1990s all the way through to today. So let's take a look at Russia for starters and compare that with Italy and Germany. So you can see that Russia went up, went down, went up, and then it went down. So it didn't have a consistent graph, but Russia is $1.65 trillion. Italy is $2 trillion and Germany is $3.95 trillion dollars and you can see the curve right there and how the three countries compare over the past 30 years. Now let's take a look at Canada, India and Australia. You look at the charts of Canada and Australia actually quite similar in terms of how they go up and down in India actually before this pandemic hit was on its way up. Generally the developing countries tend to grow at a much faster pace than the developed countries because the developed countries have more sophisticated, more evolved and more mature economies. Speaking of mature economies, let's compare India here with the United Kingdom and with Canada in this particular chart. So as you can see, India kept going up over the years again before this pandemic hit because these numbers, if you look at the past year, are completely skewed. But uh, the United Kingdom and Canada were at different trajectories and India was on its way up. Again, developing countries tend to grow faster. And now to the two biggest countries in the world by way of GDP, the United States and China. What's remarkable about the United States is despite being a large mature economy, the United States has consistently grown its GDP and China is trying to catch up. China, as you can see, had a surge relative to the United States, but the curve of the United States is so consistently high compared to all the other developed countries, all the other mature countries. This is what makes the United States economy the biggest economy in the world, the most robust economy in the world, essentially a driver to the rest of the world in terms of GDP, gross domestic product. Now, any economy, like any business, consists of buyers and sellers. The biggest buyer and seller in the United States is the United United States government. So I started doing some research and I asked myself, how does the United States government get its money and how does the United States government spend its money? So I did some research and this is what I came across. About 50%, as you can see on this article, by the way, this article is from the Tax Policy Center. You can find this online and I'll link to this in the description below. But about 50% of federal revenue comes from individual income taxes, the taxes that you pay to the federal government. Half of all the revenue from the federal government comes from individual income taxes. 7%, just 7% 
from corporate income taxes. We're talking big companies and large corporations. Just 7% of the overall revenue comes from corporate income taxes. Another 36% from payroll taxes, which by the way, comes from you, comes from your employer. So 36% comes from payroll taxes that fund programs like Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. So the rest comes from a mix of sources. You'll see this chart right here, and this chart is from the Office of Management and Budget. 50% individual income tax, 7% corporate income tax, 36% social insurance, which is payroll taxes, and the rest from excise tax, duties, and other income sources. So what's the federal income as a share of GDP? The federal government collected revenues of $3.5 trillion in 2019, which is equal to approximately 16.3% of GDP, as you can see in this chart here. So over the past 50 years, the federal revenue has averaged right around 17.4% of GDP. It's been up over the years, it's been down over the years. The next two charts are going to get really interesting. Take a look at this chart, which shows you the sources of federal revenue as a share of GDP. Now keep your eye on that orange section which is a social security payroll tax that is surprising with the creation of the medicare program in 1965 combined with periodic increases in social security which by the way is where your payroll tax dollars go that caused social insurance receipts to grow from 1.6 percent of gdp in 1950 all the way to 6.2 percent of gdp in fact that increased contribution of the payroll tax to the revenue of the federal government is shown in orange in this chart here which shows you the sources of federal revenue from 1950 all the way through 2019. This just blows my mind when I look at it. So let's start from the bottom and work our way through to the top. You see the light blue section over there? That's the individual income tax. Approximately half the revenue of the federal government comes from taxpayer dollars. And you can see the portion of the corporate income tax, which was significantly higher back in the 1950s, is now so small so small in this day and age. In other words, big companies and corporations are paying less and less, while the individual income taxpayer, the W-2 taxpayer, the ones earning wages, you, my subscribers watching this video, you have been contributing to half the revenue of the federal government, while corporations who were initially contributing more, let's look at the dark blue section of this chart here, back in the 1950s, and look at how it is more recently. They've been paying less and less. In fact, the individual income tax has provided nearly half of all total federal revenue since 1950, while all the other revenue sources have either gone up or gone down. Excise taxes bought in 19% of total revenue in 1950, but in recent years, they bought in only 3% of total revenue. Despite all of the duties and the taxes that have been levied by the federal government, they contribute to less than 3% of the total income of the federal government. Just, just uh, a lot to think about right there. The share of revenue com coming from the corporate income tax dropped from about one third of the total in the early 1950s to 7% in 2019. In contrast, payroll taxes provided more than one third of the revenue in 2019, more than three times their share in the 1950s. In other words, your pay, the payroll taxes that you pay, the payroll taxes that employers pay, is now contributing to a significant portion of the revenue of the federal government. In fact, it is the second most significant portion. If you look at this uh, this chart right here, the orange portion, and the first most, the, the biggest portion, the majority of the revenue for the federal government comes from the individual income tax, which is the light blue section at the bottom of that chart over there. So as you can see, the dark blue portion, which is the corporate income tax, and the red portion, which is the excise tax, was much larger in the 1950s and the 60s and is significantly smaller today. Now, just as a side note, the current administration has significantly reduced corporate income taxes. So you can see that portion of the corporate income tax that's already low is now essentially going to be the same or even smaller potentially because they are now paying less income taxes. And the, and the presumptive Democratic presidential nominee, Joe Biden, specifically said that he's going to be raising corporate income taxes. So that dark blue section that is really small is projected to increase if Joe Biden becomes president. In fact, let's listen to what Joe Biden had to say. He specifically talked about Amazon because Amazon, as many of you know, doesn't pay very much federal income tax. In fact, he specifically talked about Amazon and the federal income taxes that Amazon should be paying. Let's listen to what Joe Biden had to say. Mr. Vice President, just following up on that issue, uh, Elizabeth Warren uh, has talked about trying to break up Amazon, a company uh, that so many Americans uh, have become so reliant on and provided essential services during this pandemic. 
Would you seek to break that company up? I think Amazon should start paying their taxes. Okay, I don't think any company, I don't give a damn how big they are, the Lord Almighty should absolutely be in a position where they pay no tax and make billions and billions and billions of dollars, number one. Number two, I think that companies should be in a position where they start paying their employees a decent wage and protect their employees. And so that's the, the whole notion of this is, are you playing the game fairly? Like it was set up long before, what, what's the capitalist system all about? The capitalist system about everybody doing the, uh, having a, a dealing fairly and dealing straight up with the American people and with their employees. We're not investing nearly as much as we should be doing in a whole range of areas. You know that study that was done by the University of Massachusetts in 2004 to 14, corporate America, and I come from the corporate capital of the world, Delaware, <clears throat> and I'm not anti-corporate, but here's the deal. The idea that they made several trillion dollars and all the studies show that 54% went to buy back their stock, 37% to make sure their, their stockholders got rewarded, leaving 9% for research, development, raises, employment, etc. Come on, man. That's not the capitalist system. So that was interesting. Now, by the way, for me, it's not about the red or the blue. It's about the red, white and blue. So I'm not going to get into a political debate here. I'm just focused on the numbers because I think the numbers tell a story. So if you want to get into a political debate in the comment section below, be my guest. But for me, it's about the numbers. It's about the red, white and blue, just so that we are clear. So as I was researching this video, it got me thinking, how much did the federal government actually spend in 2019? Because if you remember, hopefully you remember from earlier in the video, the, the federal government took in $3.5 trillion. Well, as it turns out, the federal government spent $4.4 trillion. Now imagine a business taking in 3.5 let's just say $3.5 million and spending $4.4 million. That business isn't doing very well. It is a business that is essentially losing money every year, which by the way explains why we are in debt as a country. It's a complex subject, uh, why we are in so much debt. But just to be clear, in 2019, we collected $3.5 trillion, the United States government, and the United States government spent $4.4 trillion. So where did this money go? How was this money spent? About 62%, and you'll see this chart on your screen right here, 62% of that total was for mandatory programs. I'll break that down for you and tell you what those are. 30% covered discretionary programs for which Congress must appropriate the funds, and 8% went towards interest on government debt. Can you believe that? 8% of the expenses of the federal government went towards paying interest on the debt that the government has. So imagine for every $100 that you spent, $8 were actually spent on interest on debt that you owed from the past. I'm going to break down the spending now. So now might be a good time to get yourself a stiff drink. <laughs> Okay, so mandatory spending has grown from 31% of the budget in 1962 to 61% of the budget in 2019. So as you can see in this figure on your screen, that, that uh, light blue portion that's right in the middle between the orange and the dark blue, that has grown from just 31% in the 1960s to 61% in 2019. So where's all this money going? This is largely because of relatively new entitlements like Medicare and Medicaid, both of which started in 1965. The earned income tax credit in 1975 and the child tax credit in 1997. In addition, because there's a rapidly aging population in the United States, something that was not anticipated when the whole Medicare program was instituted in the 1960s, because of the rapid growth of both the elderly and the disabled population, the spending on Social Security and Medicare has, has gone up substantially, which is why you see that, that light blue portion, the mandatory portion, some people call those entitlement programs that has gone up significantly in the past few decades. In fact, let's take a closer look at how this mandatory spending money was actually allocated. A majority of that money, as you can see in this figure, which is called the composition of federal mandatory spending, a majority of that money was spent on Social Security. Then the money was spent on Medicare and Medicaid. You can see how these three programs constitute a majority of the spending under the mandatory spending category. Now let's go back to that chart, which has the three sections, which has the three colors in orange and the two shades of of blue, the net interest, the mandatory and the discretionary spending. We cover the mandatory. Now let's cover the discretionary spending. Now the discretionary spending needs regular renewal by Congress and the share of the budget 
that goes towards discretionary spending has fallen from two thirds in 1962 to about 30 percent now in short if you take a look at that color chart again the mandatory spending has gone up and the discretionary spending has now started to go down now what is what does the actual discretionary spending consist of the discretionary spending consists of national defense consists of education training employment and social services transportation veteran benefits and services income security health and miscellaneous programs here's an interesting fact about four percent of discretionary spending goes towards international activities like foreign aid now before i talk about debt service let me just be clear about what debt service actually means let's say you get a mortgage let's say you get a car loan when you have to pay the monthly mortgage payment when you have to pay that car loan it's called a debt service you have a debt and you're servicing that debt by making monthly payments. The US government similarly has debt service over its own debt. So that's basically what debt service means. Interest on the national debt, this is the debt of the entire country, the United States of America, has fluctuated over the past 50 years along with the size of the debt and the interest rates. By the way, low interest rates, which is the environment we are in right now, is better for the United States to pay off its national debt because essentially it's paying lower interest rates on the debt that it has. So that's an entirely separate subject in, a, in and of itself, but I wanted to touch on that. So the debt service climbed from 6.5% of the total outlays of the total expenditure in the early 1960s, it went as high as 15% in the mid-1990s. It fell to 6.1% in 2015, and then it climbed back up to 8.4% in 2019. And you can see all of that in the chart on your screen right here. Now, since 2016, the historically low interest rates, and we are in a historically low interest rate environment, have held down interest payments despite the national debt reaching a significant high of 80% of GDP in 2019. So in other words, we have a lot of debt, and if interest rates remain low, it allows us to keep our debt service payments manageable. Now, what does all this have to do with stimulus checks and unemployment benefits? In order to answer this question, let's go back to a chart that we went to earlier in this video, and this chart shows you the social sources of federal revenue. The only way to increase revenue is by changing the contribution of income from these sources. In other words, some people will have to pay more money so that there's more money in the coffers, there's more money in on the balance sheet of the federal government in order to be able to continue paying out unemployment benefits in order to have stimulus checks. So essentially, the federal government at this moment in time is essentially creating new debt, is essentially creating new money to pay, or to pay for the stimulus checks and to pay for continued unemployment benefits. But in order for the federal government to actually be profitable as a business, be profitable as an entity, be profitable as an organization, they're either going to have to A, raise individual income taxes, which is the blue portion that you see at the bottom of this chart here, B, raise corporate income taxes, which, like I mentioned earlier, Joe Biden already wants to do, increase payroll taxes. By the way, the federal government is thinking of reducing payroll taxes at this moment in time as part of a, as part of a stimulus package going further. So now you can imagine that the income going down even further. So where is the rest of the money going to come from? Or are we simply going to go deeper and deeper into debt? And the other option, as you can see at the top, is to raise excise taxes, to raise the taxes of all the goods coming into the country. Something has to give because the system cannot continue in its current state. Thank you so much for watching. I guess this was a, this was a video where you needed a drink. <laughs> I get that. I mean, when I did the research for this video, I, uh, I was... Uh, I was scratching my head because of the situation that we are in. But anyway, I hope you learned something new in this video. If you did, please click the like button. That really helps out the YouTube algorithm. That helps me a lot. A lot of effort goes into the planning of these videos, the editing of these videos. Please also click the subscribe button if you're not a subscriber already. And please, please enable notifications so you get an instant update about future important videos like this so you are more educated. And I want you to know that as a US taxpayer, you essentially are funding the the federal government and these are the numbers thank you so much for watching i'll see you in the next video and i'll see you again on ignition time bye